Shelby. I'm a retired community college history teacher and uh, here in Palo Alto, California, but my schools have been all over Northern California. I've taught at City College of San Francisco. Uh, my last school was De Anza College in Cupertino. I first became interested in materials of the Underground Railroad reading the biography of John Brown that was published in 1976 by Stephen Oates. And I fell in love with primary sources. And so I was going to school at night getting an AA in professional photography and I developed a plan for an independent study with my photography instructor there where I would go to the various archives around the country and look for these primary sources. And that is essentially defined what I've done the rest of my life because I've published then transcribed and published these very obscure sources. And uh, the first one was uh, a member of uh, John Brown's raid, Osborne Anderson. And so I transcribed his uh, his account of the John Brown Raid, which was completely different from the textbooks. Um, I got my first grant uh, with this, and that was people in the Harpers Ferry area, uh, the African American community, uh, put me up in their houses and encouraged my work, so I developed getting oral history, and then published this book. While I was doing that, I found, I discovered, I discovered a primary source which was the autobiography of an AME minister who was in the area and who was suspected of being in conspiracy with Brown. And so this uh, sent me to university because I realized that in order to document this, I had to have the skills and the discipline of properly documenting his account. Um, and I needed to meet the people. I needed to meet the scholars. And so I began doing that uh, in at UC Berkeley, 1983. And uh, then I went to graduate school at, um, at San Francisco State and both in, on both occasions I majored in Black Studies. And while I was writing my thesis, this was first a thesis, which is of course traditional. You, uh, you write your thesis and then a university press publishes your book. Um, I read the work of uh, Professor Milton Cernet about African American church and ministers. And so being from Binghamton, New York, I was going anyway to visit relatives and uh, I decided I would go to Syracuse and interview him about his work. It was very helpful because he is seminal in his thinking about the relationship of the black church to the Underground Railroad. Now I have um, a review by Cambridge University Press. What Reverend Henry did is part of like a second tier. He's not one of the movers and shakers like Frederick Douglass, but he was suspected of being in the Underground Railroad. He was very nearly arrested and he would have been hanged if he hadn't been helped out of Baltimore uh, and with uh, uh, help of both black and white friends. And so in examining him, I had had to examine his culture, and how does he write about the Underground Railroad. And so in doing that, I felt it was necessary to come from his perspective, and that's why I chose Black Studies as my major. The Underground Railroad, it's very cool to have been part of it now. Everybody wants their ancestors to have participated. Uh, the whites and the blacks want, you know, every, everybody wants to be part of it. But at that time, it was criminal 
It was a criminal offense. It was very dangerous. Over half the people who uh, attempted to escape didn't make it. Many of them died. We don't know. And so the what we don't know about the Underground Railroad and the people who didn't make it and the people who did make it but didn't make any big deal about it is going to be the really, really interesting uh, research. And I think it's a way of bringing our country together because it really was a, uh, a multiracial institution. And as it developed, it was a people's, a people's kind of thing. Very, very few uh, uh, big shots were in it. So that's, that's what I think can be done. And people like Reverend Thomas Henry, I mean, he was almost, almost jailed just for being in the Underground Railroad, as well as his name was found in the pocket of, uh, in a letter uh, from John Brown saying that he was a trustworthy man. And so he has to, uh, he has to survive. He has to save himself. He has to say, hey, I wasn't in the Underground Railroad to the judge, you know, who's backing him up and making sure he doesn't get arrested. I hope that my materials will accomplish the realization in scholarship and among the general public, and especially among students, that African Americans are responsible for their own liberation, whether it's on the Underground Railroad, whether it's participating with John Brown on an equal level, all of these things, it is an equal event and not a patronizing one. My name is Dr. Jacqueline Lawrence and I reside in Santa Rosa, California. I am the former owner of a brick and mortar underground railroad African American Museum that was located right here in Santa Rosa. And um, I also have a production company called Eris Productions. I created the museum because I virtually had a museum in my home at one time. Uh, during the weekends and on holidays, my passion was traveling with my children and visiting different places and uh, we started collecting black memorabilia several years ago and my homes were always filled with black memorabilia and when people would come into my homes uh, it was like a museum they would tour my homes my laundry room was full of laundry related black memorabilia my kitchen was filled to the max I had shelving of kitchen related black memorabilia I, my specialized collection was the mammy uh, figure uh, Aunt Jemima. In my past, as a child, my family would read uh, books from the Falcon Her series. Uh, one of the popular books turned movies was Mandingo, which came out in the, I'd say, the 60s. So they were a series of books with one of the main characters being Lucretia Borgia and she is a real strong slave character who basically ran the big house and the entire plantation. Everybody respected her, including the whites. And so from that, I, I developed a character um, that I portrayed and she was called Ms. Mammy. So I would go all over the Bay Area and um, depict this Mammy character in a one-woman um, poem that I wrote and um, from there I wrote a production called The Evolution of Mammy to show how this Mammy figure on the plantations um, evolved well actually 
she evolved from kings and queens in Africa to this Mammy character. Uh, she did not lose her strength in this transition. And even today, all the way up to Michelle Obama in the White House, she did not lose her strength. Even with all that, the racism and, and uh, just negativity that's existing even today, the black woman um, is still strong. She remains strong through it all. So songs of the Underground Railroad were coded to give traveling instructions to runaway slaves. And some of those songs were Follow the Drinking Gourd, which was the Big Dipper that pointed to the North Star up north toward Canada. So they would sing that song to let all the slaves know to head up north toward Canada where they could be free. And another song was Swang Low Sweet Chariot, which told the slaves that the chariot or the wagon to, was going to come coming for to carry me home was getting ready to come through and pick them up and ride them a little further up north. And Wade in the Water was another Negro spiritual uh, that told the slaves to get in the water to uh, thwart off the bloodhounds from their tracks because um, the slave master, the, no, the, the um, patty rollers who were the um, slave catchers were close by with their dogs so they wanted to you know get rid of the the scent it was the abolitionists as well and they, they all meant something um slaves on the plantation would sing it sing those songs like i was telling you earlier the song steal away uh, meant that uh the underground railroad is coming through or abolitionists are coming through to take you know take them off to freedom whoever wanted to get on board little chillin get on board my name is ben amada um, and i am the history librarian i'm a reference librarian here at sacramento state or california state university sacramento and the librarians uh, like me actually have numerous duties so we do library instruction give classes uh, lectures on how to find information. We do collection development. We buy the books that the uh, students use, faculty, and we then provide reference service, both at a reference desk for anybody who just drops in, and also if a student has much more and a much more in-depth question, then we would um, they can meet with us in our office. And so I typically will meet with grad students or undergrads who are doing a working on a project and I'll spend 45 minutes to an hour and we'll look at the computer looking for information. Try, try, I'll, it's my job to help them when they're dealing with research problems. My subject areas are government information. I'm in charge of our depository, our U.S. and our California depository collections. I'm the history librarian, but I'm also the criminal justice, sociology, and women's studies librarian. So those are all areas that I've developed expertise in. Uh, it's called California Underground Railroad, a digital archive. Um, and it was created from a grant written by Joe Moore, who was the husband of one of our history faculty, Shirley Moore. So they got a grant in 2000, early 2000s, around 2004. And they, Joe was the project manager. So he hired several students um, to then go out and look for material. So the first thing was to identify what material was available. And to be digitized, it had to be material that was no longer under copyright. So they couldn't really do, there were books that they found information in, but they could not digitize those books because they were under copyright. Um, what is there in the archives, therefore, then is copyright free. So there's some California state documents. There's a court case, an important court case of um, um, 
slave in California, but who then became free, and his name was Archie Lee. So there's the Archie Lee court case in there. Uh, and then a lot of the information is from a newspaper called The Elevator. And pre-1900, newspapers are not under uh, copyright and therefore can be digitized without getting copyright from from the owner or the publisher of the information. So that the archive actually includes a lot of newspaper articles, the court case, which is not uh, copyrighted, and then some other kinds of information, some California reports and things like that. So Joe got the grant uh, with his wife, Shirley, who, was, uh, who taught history here. One of the things I noticed when I was looking at some of the records today um, was that uh, the record says newspaper article and it doesn't identify the newspaper. And then as I started looking through the bibliography, I noticed that while many articles are from the African American newspaper called The Elevator, there are other articles uh, that are not. And so one of the things I need to do after today and after I get back from vacation is to contact um, and see how the records can be updated because I don't know if we still are using the same the software that we created I'm not sure that's still where it's being housed in um, it may have moved to another uh, type of software and so I think there's some for students who are using it uh, particularly for students since you're a student so you know that you have to cite your material and so by just a newspaper article and not knowing where you need to know what the title of the newspaper is so you need to be able to distinguish it's the elevator from say the Placerville Times or the Sacramento Bee or anything like that. So I just noticed that little flaw which I hadn't noticed before. Um, also, I think I, I want to go back. Um, I didn't utilize, I didn't provide the subject headings for the records. So there may be some inconsistency with the subject terms for each record. Um, there's no point in saying that you know African African using African American uh, for all records because then all the records would have it and then wouldn't do any good to to do searching just on the word African American when the whole database applies to that. So I need to review some of the uh, keywords or subject terms that have been used to make sure that uh, they're standardized and maybe to see if there's some better terms to put in. Most people do keyword searching. Uh, the problem is, is if you do keyword searching and you use a term that's not being used, then you could miss information. So I need to go through the database and uh, look at the quality of the terms that have been put in. The mother of civil rights in California, as many call her, Mary Ellen Pleasant was born on August 19, 1814 in Virginia. Earlier in her life, she was a servant to the Hussey family, abolitionists. She later married James Smith, an abolitionist and plantation owner, where they worked on the Underground Railroad together. When James Smith died, she married again to another abolitionist named John James Pleasant. Mary Pleasant started a few restaurants for the miners in California. During the time span of her life, Mary Ellen Pleasant and her husband John amassed a fortune by 1875, totaling over $30 million. Using the money from their investments, Mary Pleasant helped fund John Brown's work with the Underground Railroad all the way from California. Being the economic powerhouse in the San Francisco Bay Area she was, Mary Pleasant brought forth several civil rights lawsuits to the California court. Today, she is survived by two markers. Her grave at the Sherwood plot of Toloque Cemetery in Napa, California is marked with metal sculpture. It has also been named a Network to Freedom site by a National Park Service. The African American community of the San Francisco Bay Area considers this a sacred site for a forerunner of civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King. A Cal lecturer, Cecile Bibbs, had considerable research on the life of Mary Ellen Pleasant. She worked on a film and a documentary dedicated to Mary Ellen Pleasant. Despite Attorney Tyler's plea, the justices of the California State Supreme Court decided to reverse the lower court's award to Pleasant for the pain and suffering of discrimination. She fundraised enough money to install a new granite plaque at her burial site. 
In addition, the city of San Francisco designated eucalyptus trees that Pleasant had planted outside her mansion at Octavia and Bush Streets in San Francisco as a structure of merit. A structure of merit is a structure determined to be a resource through evaluation by the Historic Landmarks Commission's Historic Evaluation Criteria. In addition to the trees, there is a plaque on the ground which commemorates the corner park dedicated to her. It is the smallest park in San Francisco. Mary Ann Day, 1816-1884, born in New York, was the daughter of Charles and Mary Day. The family moved to Crawford County, Pennsylvania, when Mary Ann was a young girl. She married John Brown, a widower twice her age. Strong and quiet, Mary Ann Brown gave birth to 13 children over a period of two decades, outliving all but four of them. At the time of John Brown's death in 1859, she was living on the farm in North Elba, New York, where John Brown was eventually buried. In 1863, she and her children moved to California. She lived first at Red Bluff, then Ronnerville, and finally at Saratoga. Mary Ann Brown died on February 29, 1884, and was buried in Madrona Cemetery in Saratoga.